Pamela's pairs that were uh, our bank program quick and uh, relatively inexpensive. Uh, Blue Doctor launched in '98, and uh, and, uh, and spacecraft. Yet at the same time, it was the, the, the first to confirm that uh, there were hydrogen uh, and older than poles, which uh, gets into this discussion of and Nathan and, and those uh, that interesting aspect of our water. Uh, turn dust samples from uh, Comet Build 2. In the next couple of slides, I'll talk about Odyssey, MRO, Juno, Maven, and Insight, and Cyrus. Uh, Genesis return uh, uh, particle samples uh, to Earth in 2004. And then only all the mission science was achieved after that. Phoenix provided uh, a good visual evidence of uh, ice. If you take a picture of Phoenix, there's a picture of underneath the vehicle and uh, next to the next to the cluster that we we landed. Uh, there was uh, what looks to be uh, frozen just some the soil had been moved right underneath, and it's a great picture of uh, what looks like just water ice in the frozen state, just right below the surface. The, the ready spacecraft uh, provide our first good levity uh, map that uh, ultimately helps us move forward back into the Orion program when we start looking at um, doing precision guidance. You need to have a very answer of uh, what gravity field looks like in that map. And, and so the rail will help provide that. And then uh, it, it goes off with, uh, with the aero shell. That uh, Lockheed Martin has built a few shells. We built all Mars uh, aero shells for Viking, Pathfinder, MPL, Murr, Phoenix, Indusel, Insight, and for return missions, Genesis, Plus Osiris, as well as the uh, Orion aero shell. A lot easier with aero shells. So we've kind of did it or off in the last day and a half. Uh, it's, it's interesting is that spacecraft functionality is very dependent now on uh, onboard software. And we've run from what were simple rudimentary controllers um, to a much more complex system now, but much, much more capable. Um, I'm not sure that anyone knows what a early spacecraft looks like, but uh, it's an able back and look backward and find these early vehicles were controlled very much with ground control. They, they, someone on the ground figured out whether it had to be fired and what what that time duration was and what that event time was. And they used a ground system to radiate that command at the specific time that the spacecraft needed to execute. Um, pretty amazing. I mean, there's no onboard controller. You have to do it on the ground. And so the ground system is very tightly coupled to that problem. And also, really, what you can do, you can't go behind the planet and achieve uh, ability to have that attack. You have to have ground interaction immediately. Now, systems that are uh, very autonomous by, by comparison, and, and all that subsystem functionality is slowly migrating to. And usually with some form of autonomous action, it's not just a sequence hand event. It's a spacecraft goes and does the activity that you would bring in the tool one. So uh, that is why we're all here. It's, uh, it's without some form of onboard embedded behavior. You need that to be on board, and you need that software to go do that task. And, and this enables that system. Talk for just a few moments about what <coughs> now commonplace in uh, planetary uh, vehicles. Most of the modern systems have some form of cost, less, uh, for example, CX works. 
we're not spending a lot of time rolling on our kernels. And we can leverage uh, the, the features of what was provided in the development environment. Uh, I mean, my permit, uh, you know, you get a couple thousand lines for your own kernel, and then you discover that your development environment doesn't exist, then you say, I have to go fuss with that for a while. And uh, we're not doing that. We'll focus much more on the, the larger elements of the system. And that includes the standard interfaces. on Mars Odyssey was part of uh, the better, faster, cheaper approach in the 90s. And it's been as uh, Odyssey launched in 2001. Our sea is uh, so proud. Mm -hmm. uh, the NASA's ready to uh, follow water and so um, sooner went into a science phase. Uh, the RS instrument was uh, really identifying uh, voice regions 
on the surface and, and since had uh, several full mapping cycles um, and, and had a great impact on the subsequent Mars missions where the, the rovers have landed and where uh, future missions are, are still yet to go explore. A lot to do with the GRS mapping of, uh, of Mars. The sixth extended mission, and we expect it to uh, be active until 2020. And uh, right now, its primary role or primary role is moved to uh, a UHF relay support for uh, Merlin and MSL. I started its science mission in 2006. And as the name lies, its uh, primary um, payload is a uh, but it's got multiple roles, but it, it doesn't have a high resolution imager that um, has been fruitful to the point where you can see rotor tracks um, from orbit. And the three high gain antenna is uh, helps provide the volume of data that uh, it, it comes from that system that is fixed megabits from from Mars. And so far, the space craft has heard 250 terabits of data, so it's uh, well surpassed its minimum capability by a factor of 10 almost. Uh, the MRO runs on a, uh, a Red 750 in a compact PCI chassis. And it has a good size solves the recorder as well. So it, it's in its third ended mission, we expect this to to go past 2020. And uh, right now, we're working with Google while we're supporting uh, UHF and other surface assets. You know, in 2011, and you have the assist to um, help swing up the spacecraft for Jupiter. The space uh, is nine months away, so we have a July 4th. Um, not soon, um, and at which point uh, it will be the fastest spacecraft ever built by man, um, with a period to be about 130,000 miles per hour. So that's a lot faster than Mars. <laughs> Noted. To first solar power spacecraft that operate in June. Um, 50 square meters of solar cells. It still only supplies uh, less than 500 watts of power in the mission. So, fair distance from the sun. Um, probably more driving problem is for the Jupiter experiment. Um, the spacecraft is expected to receive more than 100 megarads of total dose on the mission. And it's a short, basically a year and a half mission. So um, Jupiter's not a nice place. It's a pretty nasty place. Uh, Juno ran a red 750 in a compact TI, and it uh, has also 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, it's got 20 processors on the spacecraft from various points. These are CMDHs or instruments or. Um, you know, various across the spacecraft. So we all need to learn about what uh, Jupiter is going to tell us. Uh, in that its uh, mission is, is, is to sample the atmosphere of Mars directly. And so this spacecraft design has got a, a better solar array. The atmosphere and then they'll dip in, go through service, you know, come back out. Obviously, sustain a uh, repeated multi orbit for a long mission with uh, the active orbit drag as a function of long term. So, they will dip in and dip out, do that campaign, done that campaign uh, four times now. Uh, they've completed their 
primary mission was last month. And so they're working on what their next extension is, is what they have a dual role capability as well with uh, JPL, Electra, and Woodstock to be able to do another on board in those support surface assets. So the two uh, missions that I'll briefly cover here are Insight and Cyrus. And these are um, up in the next year. The core of uh, Insight is to ultimately put the site monitor is down the cartoon with this lower, looks like a little half shaped dome. Um, it comes uh, on it, it's a French contributed instrument. And it is placed on the surface with a robot arm, and the arm comes from a fire mission that we supply to JPL. It launches next March. This vehicle launches next March, and touchdown is in September. And uh, this mission is about a two-year mission. Early mission, one model. Runs until 2018. And then, what's not common for Mars surface vehicles is that uh, it spends a fair amount of time asleep. Um, it has a night time, and a solar power vehicle can't last the night without some form of low power mode. And so, it, it, it has sure that it wakes up, gathers data that the instrument has been in the state on, gathers data, stores it. Goes back to gather data, stores it, goes back to school, and then uh, waits for what we call half the AHF or the pin event, and go relay that back to Earth. Which uh, is the mission is to basically go up and kiss that asteroid that uh, Rob just talked about. Um, it's a hard task. Know that uh, at APL, the year guys have had that experience of how hard that can be. I know that uh, Rosetta is talking about that now. Um, the Bentley sample return is also challenging the same task. It's, it's, there's no easy solution here. Um, this mission is built around the, what looks like a boom on the bottom of that uh, cartoon there. Um, their goal is to, is to bring what may sound like not much, 60 grams of, of regular, um, but it is a achievable goal, at least we think so. The um, vehicle will, in a fair amount of time, uh, get to its target, and then uh, basically a first year of, of primary operations in terms of, of uh, anchor and discovery and mapping and, and preparing for sampling and collection. Um, because we don't have a really good understanding of surface features from Earth, we have to go basically do it in situ at the spacecraft. And so once done, then there's a phase of, okay, spacecraft, go do it event. And so there's some autonomy that has to happen at that point. And that that rendezvous action go activity is all on board. And uh, it's not launched that way, meaning uh, we don't know the map, we don't know the, the, the total visible characteristics of the surface to really go capture. And certainly the, the site selection hasn't been chosen yet either. There'll be site selection after um, arrival. So, site is uh, a seven year mission and returns to Earth. Sample return in 2023. Short time we've essentially seen the evolution of abstractions of our code generation. But you can generate your term where it's moved to assembly language. Unfortunately, that moves to more language. And we extract code data the whole system. It's 
not uncommon to see auto encoding systems that uh, help us reduce the life cycle cost and feedback rates. This graphing is we spend time on this little blue triangle at the top of this. You start looking at the larger system. I think yesterday's discussion hinted at this. We we can build that top product without a framework underneath it. It just you're just hacking at it if you're trying to just spend your time in the blue triangle. The underlying system and, and we all write a lot of us very many lines of code every day on the desktop. And your system that builds white code doesn't doesn't without that larger element of system. Frankly there an easy task to go put that all together and make it work reliably. We will build that blue product, yes. So that's what we focus on. Fortunately, most of these frameworks provide you know pretty reasonable capabilities and not have to discover why this cost product is or isn't working. Um, but they're not, not they don't come out of that. Our fusions will continue the migration of ground operations tasks to spacecraft capability. What to the point where we can say two missions spacecraft go? Clear that tomorrow's large complex systems will be larger than today's large complex systems. And, and today's systems absolutely depend on software. Our future will have more autonomy and we'll be able to recover some down control. So, you know, we've had some odd copters from, from a commercial or a consumer that wants to go to the successful plans require well engineered development environments that will help us make those and that our future enterprise embrace that software as a critical component of success. Is that easy for us as engineers? Because we need the software every day. The harder part is getting a, a larger, larger enterprise to, or a larger community um, to go embrace what that really does for them. Any large complex. Systems and software and it is your job, it's our job to go engineer the system because that's the way to buy itself. Thank you. So, if anybody has questions, please come forward. talking about this last night again. Yeah. And uh, the fine thing is that uh, auto code is, is the, the defect rate, if you will, because you're not typing the defect. It, it still doesn't, my opinion, doesn't do what it needs to do. Okay. And the question is, because you start looking at you're still generating effectively code if you're no generators. They're not really working the next level up. So that's fine. Okay. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that problem solution.